Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. The Apostle Paul is looking at things from a God's eye view. That's what theology often does. It takes all of existence and it holds it up to the light like a prism, shifts it ever so slightly to see how it looks from every different angle. Theology takes the big picture and tries to make sense of it all. But we don't live life from a God's eye view, do we? We live life here, on the ground, in the flesh, from one holy minute to another. We heard this morning from Paul's letter to the Colossian church. Truth be told, it may not actually be Paul writing. It's possible it was one of his followers who lived a little bit later in the first century, but someone, we'll call them Paul, is concerned that these Colossian Christians are losing their grounding in the faith. They received the gospel eagerly when it was first preached among them, but now it's getting kind of stale, and they're combining it with another set of teachings, a more mystical, spiritual strain of thought that we call Gnosticism, Say that five times fast. Now, Gnosticism isn't all bad. There's a lot of it that dovetails quite nicely with the gospel that Paul is preaching. There were Gnostic Jews, Gnostic Christians, and you might have heard of Gnostic gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas, which combined Gnostic teachings with the teachings of Jesus. Often, they worked out. In fact, I think the reason that Paul feels so threatened by Gnosticism is that it is so close to the gospel he preaches. Gnosticism and Christianity, they blend so well together with one big exception. Gnosticism is all about the mind. Gnosis, that Greek word for knowledge. Gnosticism is about the spiritual, the transcendent things, that which is mystical and cosmic. They share that with Christians who also think about these things. Gnosticism, too, tries to stop and see the world from a God's eye view. But the difference is that Gnosticism rejected the flesh, the body, the physical world in which we live. It taught that creation and flesh itself are a source of evil and therefore something that we as humans are called to transcend. The more spiritual we become, the less in our bodies we should be. So Gnosticism taught people to deny their bodily desires, needs, pleasures, focus it all on the mind, spirit. For that is where we attain salvation. And to that, Paul says, oh no, this must be rejected because indeed that is the crux of the gospel. The flesh, God with skin on, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, who dwelt among us. And Jesus reconciles us to God and to one another, not in mind or spirit, but in flesh and body. Through life on earth and death on a cross. Paul tells his Colossian friends, we Christians cannot abide this Gnostic teaching. 
We cannot deny the goodness of our bodies. Because in Jesus Christ, we have seen the goodness of real physical creation. We have met a God who is not found in esoteric wisdom or among the heavenly beings, but who is sought here on earth in the flesh. Next week, we begin the Christian season of Advent of waiting and preparing ourselves for the coming of Christ at Christmas. And this Advent, we are going to talk about incarnation. Bodies. The word who became flesh and dwelt with us. A God who chose to enter the world not in majestic power, but in the miracle of childbirth. Who chose bodily, who chose to leave bodily existence, not with a triumphant angelic procession, but through death on the cross. We will explore all this with the help of a woman named Dr. Cole Arthur Riley and her book, This Here Flesh, the Toni Morrison quote, a meditation on embodied spirituality. Dr. Riley is an author, a poet, and a liturgist, but she is also a woman living with a chronic autoimmune disorder that affects her mobility and vision, among other things. So she admits to having a rather complicated relationship with her own body. She's also Black. She's also a woman. And Lord knows those aspects of her existence have made embodiment a bit more traumatic for generations, even before her. Dr. Riley admits that she doesn't always know what she feels about this experience of being embodied, and yet Dr. Riley is committed to a contemplative Christian practice that focuses not on esoteric truth, but on flesh and blood experience. The stories of our own ordinary lives. In the preface to her book, she puts it this way. She writes, I used to think that Christian contemplation was reserved for white men who leave copies of C.S. Lewis screwed about the office and know a great deal about, deal about coffee and beard oils. And if that is you, don't worry, there is always room for you here. But she says, I am interested in reclaiming a contemplation that is not exclusive to whiteness, to intellectualism, to ableism, or to hobby. She says, as a Black woman, I am disinterested in any call to spirituality that divorces my mind from my body, my voice, my people. To suggest a form of faith that tells me to sit down alone and be quiet, it does not rest easy on the bones. It is just a shadow of true contemplative life. I think this is what Paul is trying to tell the Colossians. That theirs is a story of real human life in flesh and blood. Of a savior who died on the cross. That this person, the crucified Christ himself is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the body, the beginning, the end. In him, Paul writes, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. All the fullness of God. Think about that. 
all the fullness of God could not be encapsulated or contained in all of creation. Neither the majestic mountains nor the bottomless seas. Even they are not big enough to contain our God. All the fullness of God cannot be described by great wisdom, sharp minds, profound spirituality. For there is no knowledge, neither human or divine, that is quite deep enough to touch our God. No, in Jesus Christ, we see that all the fullness of God can only be met in flesh, in body, in community, in a woman giving birth, in a man who breathes his last, in human hands reaching out to one another. This and only this is big enough for all the fullness of God to dwell. How do we respond to something like that? With our bodies, with our lives, in the real practical moments of daily living, we love one another right here, right now, in this place, in these bodies. For indeed, Paul says, in Jesus Christ, something great is taking place. The reconciliation of all things is at hand, but it happens to flesh and blood, to bodies and bones. All the fullness of God is too grand for anything else. So today, on Reign of Christ Sunday, we proclaim our hope that salvation is indeed accomplished. Good triumphs over evil. Life triumphs over death. Christ takes his place as Lord of all. The entire cosmos is redeemed. At least, that's what it looks like from a God's eye view. Here, in this flesh, it just looks like loving each other. Amen. Amen. Amen.